take your coffee break with me. Come and take your coffee break with me. Come and take your coffee. Come and take your coffee. Come and take your coffee break with me. So welcome back to Coffee Break with Candace. I'm so glad that you tuned in this week and we have another amazing guest and I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell us more. Hello, Candace. Thank you so much for having me a part of your show. Um, my name is Keith Beauchamp. I am a unintentional filmmaker, I would call myself, <laughs> but I'm known for the documentary, The Untold Story of Emmett Lewis Till. I was the filmmaker involved in getting his case reopened in 2004. And I'm also um, a formal executive producer and a host of the Injustice Files for Investigation Discovery that deals with civil rights murders and injustices that we face throughout our community abroad. So uh, it's wonderful to be here with you. Um, thank you for really for having me. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here. It's amazing. Uh, to have you here. And I'm so excited to hear more of your story. And if you wouldn't mind sharing how you got to be an unintentional filmmaker and what you started out, you know, in terms of your journey with. Sure. Um, wow. My journey with Emmett Till um, started when I was just 10 years old. I was, I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I was in my parents' study and I came across an old jet magazine. And as I opened the pages, I came across this angelic face of this young little boy, sort of a mirror image of myself at the time. And then on the other side of the page was this horrific face of this monster. And I could not understand what happened to this kid. And my mother and father was just so happy to, they were walking past the study. And my mother looked in and she sees me with my mouth open and she walks in. And she looks over my shoulder and she sees what I'm looking at. And then I, I can recall her looking back at my father and he walks over and he also sees that I have this page of Emmett Till's photograph in my face. And um, they decided at that time to teach me about the story, to tell me the story, I should say. But throughout my life, the name Emmett Till kept resurfacing when I got into high school. I was interracially dating. And the first thing my parents would tell me before I left the house at night was, don't let what happened to Emmett Till happen to you. Mm. So it became an educational tool to teach me about the racism that still exists throughout the country and particularly in the South at the time. But um, I have to say my real run in with racism happened two weeks before my high school graduation. I was at a pre-graduation party for local high schools in the area and I was assaulted by an undercover police officer for dancing with a white classmate of mine. And that's what spurred me into wanting to fight for justice. And I felt the only way that could be possible if I became a part of the system. So I began to study criminal justice at Southern University of Baton Rouge in hopes of becoming a civil rights attorney. But during my junior year of college, I was introduced to filmmaking by my childhood friend who had moved to New York City uh, with his sister, and she had her own film production company, so I was introduced to filmmaking in that manner. But my, my journey continued on, and we were producing and writing music videos. I felt like that wasn't giving anything back to my community, and at a company <laughs> that my evening, um, I was asked if there was a story that I would like to pursue as a feature film, and the story was Emmett Till. Um, the name that I heard most of my life. Mm -hmm. And so that's how my journey with Emmett started. But when I decided to take on the case um, and, and to pursue a film about the story of Emmett Till, the first thing I, I knew I needed to have was the support of his mother, Mother Mo. Mm -hmm. And um, First thing I did was I decided I would reach out to her. And um, that was a story within itself. Oh, please share was, that. <laughs> it just took me a, 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 a lot of courage 
to build up the confidence to talk to her because the first time I called, I actually hung up in her face. Did you really? And I did. And the reason being is because I wasn't too prepared in terms of what her day was like. I was worried that I would open up old wounds. And I'm this young guy in my early 20s. So I didn't know exactly what I was getting myself into, but I knew that she was still around, um, still fighting for justice for our son. I just didn't want to catch her on a bad day. And so that first phone call, (laughs) reaching out to her, she picks up and I immediately hang up. (laughs) And so, but I, I sat by the phone for a minute and I said, you know what, I have to call her back. Because if this is something that I really want to pursue, I have to have her support before anything. And so I did. I built up that courage, called her back. And as soon as she picked up the phone, I explained to her it was was me (laughs) that called before. And I apologized for hanging up in her face. But I, I told her, you know, about my life and how nervous I was just to reach out to her because for some reason, I have this connection with our son. I've had this connection since I was 10 years old. And I felt like there's something more for me to do. And it had to do with our son. And of course, my experiences shaped me, but it was very important for me to reach out to her at that particular time and to um, build a friendship that ended up lasting for nine years until she unfortunately passed away. And so that was probably the biggest highlight of my career and journey was meeting Mother Mold. Um, she was my confidant, um, my friend, my mentor. Um, she was the mother of the civil rights movement to me. And so um, to be able to align our um, resources and not just resources, just to align our time together, the times that I spent with her and just to have her on my side and encouraging me to, and pushing me. Um, she was nurturing me into the, to an activist um, that I've become without me knowing. And so I, my life I owe dearly um, to Mother Mobley and the legacy of her son, where I believe if it wasn't for the murder of Emmett Till and her legacy, um, there would not be a Keith Beauchamp filmmaker. And that's why I call myself this unintentional filmmaker, because this is not something that I had in mind to do. So so tell us more about the making of the Emmett Till documentary. I know meeting her was an incredible experience and, and really important for you, but who are some of the other people that you got the opportunity to meet and interview? And was there pushback when you, because this, I mean, his, his death was so brutal, so horrible. So I so reopening those wounds, what was that like in, in your investigative process? The first thing I did when I um, started the journey to shoot the film, I went to the Delta myself. Um, again, I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. People would say right down the street from the Delta, but it's like five hours away, right? But um, I went there to see and, and to feel the atmosphere. I wanted to get as much of the story as I could possibly have, but I also wanted the feeling of, of, you know, being at the same place where Emmett Till was back in 1955. So I spoke to my father, I said, hey dad, let's go on a road trip. We got in the car and we drove to the Delta. And when we got there, I was completely shocked. And the reason why I was so shocked was that You know, there's so many plantation homes as far as you can see. You have all this land and cotton everywhere. This area, Greenwood, Mississippi, mining Mississippi area is is considered to be the cotton capital of the world. Well, it was the cotton capital of the world at one time. And so just going into that atmosphere and just seeing black people still working on plantations And this is the early 90s, this is like 94, 95. And so I was just completely blown away because although we, you know, Louisiana is not so much different, I was just shocked to see that time stood still in this particular area. And so when I start reaching out to people in the community, 
people I would see on the street, I would stop them and ask them about Till, and they were afraid to utter the name Emmett Till. Mm, wow. When he was forbidden to talk about the story. And so that's when I realized I was going to be hitting these obstacles along the way, because to me, it was a story of the past. But to these folks who live in that community, this is like yesterday, and they were still living with those demons. And so I, I eventually started reaching out to the cousins of Emmett Till, who was present in 1955, who, to whom he visited in 1955. When he went to Money, Mississippi, um, it was fortunate to have them still alive. But um, it took me three years to get Simeon Wright, the cousin of Emmett Till, who shared the bed with him the night of the abduction. It took me three years to get him to talk to me. Um, and so a lot of my time, it was a nine year effort. And the reason why it took so long was because the witnesses who had never spoke publicly before, they were afraid to come forward to talk to me. And so I had to throw that filmmaker's hat aside and become friends with them long enough for them to trust me and of course, tell me their story. And so that time, you know, many, I would never, I would have to say work on a film like that again, that would take so long to make. And, but it was worth it. It was worth it because I was able to get um, these witnesses to confide in me enough to tell me their story. And um, I was able to tell their story, of course, um, not only with the documentary, but use it as a stepping stone to get the case reopened. And that's what eventually happened. So let me ask you this. Um, how do you stay strong uh, as a filmmaker, uh, as, a, as a person when you're dealing with such heavy, you know, such a heavy subject, such a terrible, a situation occurred and how do you stay strong through all that and not really get overwhelmed by that? Well, Candace, that's a good question because I'm often asked that. Um, I don't think people realize my journey as much. They see the, you know, the glitz and the glamour of the finished product. They don't see the struggle behind the scene. And I have to remind people, I was 22 years old when I first started my research on Till. And so I was just this young kid in Baton Rouge trying to find his way, you know, and, you know, moved to New York City, going back and forth, you know, just trying to find out what would be my niche in life. And now I'm 49. And so I have not done anything um, different from what I've been doing since I started. In fact, off the heels of the production of the Emmett Till case and the reopening of the case in 2004, I was brought into this relationship with the FBI and Justice Department to assist them on other civil rights murder cases. And so I was afraid to stop. So I kept doing the work, investigating other unsolved civil rights murder cases and it was a promise that I gave to Mother Mobley. You know, there were two promises I gave her. I would do all I can to make sure her son's case is reopened. And after I was finished with that, I will pursue other unsolved civil rights murder cases because that's what she wanted me to do. And so, um, you know, I just feel like I'm obligated, you know, to do this work and it's challenging. Um, it's not natural for one to deal with death all the time. And that's what I've been doing. But it's the only thing I have ever, ever known. You know, I go to bed at night thinking of Emmett Till. I wake up in the morning thinking of Emmett Till. It is not a natural way of living, but I look at it as being a trade. You know, I, um, the reopening of the case was another big highlight of my life. Never thought that, you know, me as an individual would have such a voice to cause change in my own way. And um, of course, a lot of people supported me with the reopening of the case, but being the impetus to it, um, you really don't know the power that you have. With all that has happened in the recent year, um, or years, and the, you know, the injustices I continue to see, it, it takes a part of, part of me. Um, it takes a part out of me, I should say, uh, when these things happen. And so I find myself 
really trying to figure life out now, Candice. You know, like I said, it's that's a hard question to ask someone who has devoted your whole entire life to the call. It is not an easy road. And many of us who work in this field, the civil and human rights field will tell you, it, it's not a, a glamor job. It's, it's not something that is easy. So you live with that pain and you learn how to deal with it. And that's what I've been able to do. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us more about the, uh, the TV show and how that opportunity came to be? Oh, wow. <laughs> that's a really good question. Well, my first TV series um, was TV One's Murder in Black and White. It was hosted by Reverend Al Sharpton. It was a cross between Unsolved Mysteries and America's Most Wanted. And it, it all came because of my work with Emmett Till. And so, you know, um, they, Jonathan Rogers reached out to me at the time. He was president at um, TV One. And he said, Keith, I, I would love to give you an opportunity to come over and work with our network. And he gave me a series on the spot. And then after that, I, I went to um, the History Channel. And um, David McKillop, um, the executive over there, he said, I would give you a show. I want to give you a special. But the only way that can happen if you're in front of the cameras, because before then, I was only working behind the cameras doing these documentaries. And um, by him um, allowing me or encouraging me to be in front of the camera, it really opened the door for me to work with CBS and create the Injustice Files, which was the last series, um, the latest series, I should say, that I had going on. And that also came by way of someone giving back to me, and that was the late, great Ed Bradley. Oh, wow. And, uh, yes, and um, Mr. Bradley did a um, 60 minutes piece on myself and the Emmett Till case, right when it reopened in 2004. And he was behind the scenes working with me and trying to figure out ways to assist me because although my parents gave me the financing to produce the film, there were some other issues I had, such as trying to clear archival footage which I had over $260,000 worth of footage alone in the film. Are and you serious? Yes. Oh my yes. gosh. I'm like, <laughs> wow. No, I mean, what? <laughs> alone, uh, that was it alone. And um, the greatest thing was uh, Mr. Bradley asked me after we did the show, he said, Keith, you're going to always have me here for you. What do we need to get this film out there to the public? And I said, you know, I got like over $200,000 worth of footage from CBS that I need to get cleared. I don't have the money for. He picked up the telephone, called the archives, came back to me, said, now you have all the footage that you want uh, for perpetuity. Oh my oh. God. I'm sorry. Like, that's incredible. Wow. So um, I have to pay homage to him because um, I was a huge fan of his. And to think that my life was connected to this very historic case, and then I'm becoming a part of that history as well. And having the late great Ed Bradley interview me for 60 minutes. That was a huge, I have many highlights. I know I've been talking about these highlights, but as I'm thinking, there's been many. And um, he, was, he was just a very wholesome and great, you know, nice man. And he said to me, he said, Keith, whenever you're ready, come back. When you're ready to really get out there, come back and we're going to help you get there. And so he unfortunately passed away, I believe it was 2008 when he passed away. and. Um, or maybe it was 2006. And the first thing I did when everything started building up for me in my career, I met with Jeff Fager, um, the president of CBS News because he and Ed Bradley was close. And he invited me in and I pitched him an idea that I had about producing a television series on civil rights murder. And I didn't think he would bite on it. I, you know, I didn't think 
he would, you know, agree to do something like that, but he did. And he connected me with um, Susan Zarensky, who's also not, who's now the president of CBS News. And so it's true. I mean, what they say, you know, in, in, when you have a career and you have this, you know, you, when you're on this fight to find, you know, find your niche to, you know, to hold on to something, um, the creator always put people in your path to help you. Tell us about the, the feature film that you're working sure. on. Well, the feature film called Till is being produced by myself, Fred Zolo, who produced Mississippi Burning and Goes to Mississippi, Barbara Broccoli from the James Bond franchise, and Whoopi Goldberg, as well as Thomas Levine and Michael Riley. And this is my dream team that have, have been in my life for a good 17 years, <laughs> um, fighting with me to try to get this story told. And I tell you, there are a lot of pitfalls along the way. You know, people have showed interest and then people didn't show interest. It was just very hard and difficult to get a story like this out. In fact, um, a Till movie has ne have never been produced. Um, in 60 years. And so- Why do you think you did it? Well, it, it's not a why, we know why. Um, the reason being is because um, it was a story that people wanted to forget, not talk about. It deals with the sex and race issue, a problem that we still have today talking about in the public forum. And not only that, um, the Emmett Till case, and I think it's only right to do this, Candace, people really need to understand this story. Because, you know, we don't say that Emmett became the catalyst that sparked the civil rights movement. Like, he was the catalyst. It's because of Till's death that Rosa Parks decided not to get up from her, her seat on that bus in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. It's because of the murder of Emmett Till, a 26-year-old Dr. Martin Luther King decides to take on the Montgomery bus boycott. He felt that the murder of Emmett Till was an intimidation factor to keep the Black keep Black people away from the polls. 1955 was an election year. It's sad to think, even with the way I was taught about Emmett Till, right? It's sad to think that, you know, during my father's time, the story of Emmett Till happened and his family and, and the elders around him teaches him these black male codes that all of us as young black males when we reach puberty have to learn. Um, it's sad to think my parents taught me that. And now if I ever have a kid, I will have to teach that kid that as well, that we're still generationally um, bringing this practice. The other thing we're going to do is um, switch topics and do a segment I call Who Said That, where I will give you, yes, I'll give you a quote and a clue. You get one guess. And if you, uh -oh. Yes. And if you tell me who said that, I will donate a modest amount to the charity of your choice. Oh, that's sweet. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Look at oh. you. Well, I like, I like doing that. And I, plus, I love hearing about the various charities that people support. I have my own, yeah. of course, but I love hearing about, you know, what other people are supporting. Um, and so do you have a charity in mind? If not, um, you course. can. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> of course. And guess, what it, guess what the charity have? Um, <laughs> the charity is linked to. Me too. But go ahead. Now you go ahead and tell us about your charity. Well, it's not my charity. Mm -hmm. It's actually a charity of the relatives of Emmett Till, the mm -hmm. Emmett Till Legacy Foundation. Awesome. And, um, and so they're doing a lot of great work with educating and giving um, um, scholarships to young people uh, to continue their education. And so, oh, it's fantastic. Um, I've been working with them for a while and, you know, it's, we're on this fight together to get justice for Emmett Till first. And, um, but we do a lot of events together and talk to a lot of schools and civil rights organizations and, you know, just to keep Emmett's name out there, which is very important. Absolutely, it is. That's wonderful. So the quote is, a wise man can play the part of a clown, 
but a clown can't play the part of a wise man. A wise, a wise man can play the part of a clown, but a clown can't play the part of a wise man. Hold on, let me. <laughs> Would you like the clue? Okay, all right. So the, <laughs> so the person who said that um, was an African-American Muslim minister and human rights activist who was a popular figure during the civil rights movement. He is best known for his time spent as a vocal spokesman for the nation of Islam. Yes, the late great Malcolm X. Yes, yay, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so I will donate to your charity. So, and happily, happily do so. Oh, thank you, Candace. Emmett was the happiest baby in the world. Emmett was mischievous. We had fun together. We laughed together. He had no sense of danger. Everything was funny to him. They always kind of prep you for going to Mississippi. And I don't know if Emmett was told or not. Mrs. Bryant came out of the store. That's when Emmett whistled at her. Yes, he whistled at Carolyn Bryant when she came out of the store. Sunday morning, about 2.30, there was a man with a pistol, and he said, I want the boy from Chicago. I knew they weren't going to bring him back. It was a terrifying experience. The sheriff told me they had found the body, one of the most barbaric atrocities committed against a child in the history of mankind. Oh, my God. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, we're going to open the casket. Let the people see what I've seen. We never have any trouble until some of our southern niggas go up north and the NAACP talks to them and they come back home. Oh, yeah. He stood up, pointed his finger, said, that's him. God is watching. Not guilty. Oh, yeah. Emmett was the catalyst that started the civil rights movement. If it can further the cause of freedom, then I will say that he died a hero. He is watching. She made America deal with its ugly racial problem. He whistled at a white woman and ended up dead at the bottom of a river. Now, nearly 50 years later, a film called The Untold Story of Emmett Lewis Till helped reopen his case. We owe it to Emmett Till. God is we owe it to his mother, we owe it to ourselves.